Real people. Real radio. Wherever you are, make it TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. You're listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project. With your host, Rob Skiba. All I'm offering is the truth. Hello and welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. And tonight is going to be a part two episode, continuing where we left off last week. And my guest was Lex Meyer. And since I already read his bio and introduced him in the last episode, we'll just go ahead and get started. Lex, are you there? I'm here, Rob. Hey, man. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Boy, uh, that last show stirred up uh, <laughs> uh, a fair amount of uh, comments, both positive and negative. Uh, good. Item- <laughs> yeah, good, right? Um, and led me down an interesting rabbit trail. I-, I watched a video and posted a video by uh, Walter Veith. Are you familiar with him? Yeah, I've I've uh, seen some of his stuff. I, I I know which one you're talking about. I actually saw you share it. Yeah, uh, the onslaught of death. Yeah, he was tracking. It sounded like a lot along pretty much the same lines that you were. Yeah, um, a lot of the same same stuff that I. He has a lot of the same conclusions that I found in scripture. There's a couple things I disagree with him on, but uh, for the most part, it's he has a lot of the. Says a lot of the same kind of things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it's what did you disagree with? Um, you know, I'm trying to remember back to what the video is. I think he believes that Elijah did go to heaven, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. And I think he basically says that there's only like two or three people who've gone to heaven, but everybody else is waiting. And I disagree with that uh, because of what uh, Yeshua said in John three thirteen: No one has gone to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the son of uh, the son of man who is now in heaven, uh, talking about himself, saying that you know he's the only one who's come and gone from heaven, and he's actually it's, it's referencing a proverb, um, and in the proverb it says, uh, you know who is God and and uh, what is his son's name, and you know who is ascended to heaven, who is descended, tell me his name and tell me the name of his son or something like that. It it's kind of a loose quote. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but. Um, it's, he's basically referencing that verse, and what he's saying is is connecting with that verse there, that he's the only one who's come and, come and gone from heaven, and, uh, you know, he's the son of God. But, you know, if, if, uh, you know, if, if anybody would know who's gone to heaven, it would be him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would think. Um, if he's gone, then I'm, I'm going to believe him. <clears throat> sure. Now, we, we talked about Elijah to this. A, you know, for a fair amount in the last episode. Um, I have heard the argument from others that he was just basically transported, uh, similar to Philip, when he was talking with the Ethiopian eunuch and then was transported and went elsewhere. Uh, yeah. Based on the scripture, it talks about Elijah writing a, a letter to somebody, I forget who, uh, something like 10 years later or something like that. Yeah, to harm. Okay, so... Um, Okay. The, the Elijah argument, I can, I can understand. But what do you do with Enoch? Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. And if we give any credibility to the book of Enoch, um, he clearly went somewhere, and it appears to be heaven. He was shown a whole lot of things. Um, yeah. So, what's your take on 
and I knew that we weren't going to have time to really dive into this in the last episode, so I'm just going to go ahead and lead with it in this one to make sure we've got plenty of time to, to deal with the Enoch issue. What's okay. your take on Enoch? Uh, well, I mean, you know, first off, we've got to realize that a lot of things that people um, deal with with Enoch are assumptions. Uh, the Bible says that God took Enoch, but it doesn't tell us where he took him. The Bible never says it took him to heaven. Um and so that's a conclusion people jump to when it says God took Enoch. They say, oh, he took him to heaven. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, you know, it, uh, some of the things in the wording of how it phrases things is interesting as well. Um, Enoch, you know, it says that he uh, basically he lived. Uh, was it 365 years? I think. Yeah. yeah. And then God took him. And if you look at all the other people who were living around his time, that was really young compared to most of the other people. I mean, you know, there's people in six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred years old um, around the time of him. And he's taken before he's even 400. And so it's very, very early. So when it, the Bible says God took him, uh, it could be, you know, a reference to him dying at an early age or him being... Um, you know, taken away at an early age. And so that's, that's one interesting thing to think about. Um, and, you know, again, the phrase uh, that's used is God took him and he was not. Um, and, you know, if you look at how that's used in other places, um, it, it's, it means he was no more or he could not be found. And so it's not necessarily mean that, um, it, it, it could be used to mean that he died, you know, so that he was he was no more. He could not be found. It could also be a, a, a way of saying he died. Um, and I'm kind of giving a little back, background on some of the wording here before we get into the, the depth of it. Um, another phrase that's used. Um, and let's see. Oh, uh, an expression of death. Uh, the same kind of expression of death is in the Psalms. It says, uh, for a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for this place, but it shall not, it shall be no more. And so the phrase, it shall be no more, uh, is a reference to the people who have died or been destroyed. They will be no more. Um, and then we see the same phrase being used in the prophets. Um, Let's see. The I've made Esau bear. I have uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His descendants are plundered, his brethren and his neighbors, and he is no more. Another reference to death. The iniquity of Israel shall be sought, but there shall be none. And the sin, uh, sins of Judah, but they shall not be found. And so these are, you know, these are phrases that are used. Uh, various places in the Bible that are in connection with Enoch. Now, when we look at he the book of uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter eleven, it talks about Enoch, <clears throat> and it uses an interesting phrase. It says, "By faith, Enoch was taken away, so that he did not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God." Um. And, you know, most people read that and say, oh, it, it, you know, right there it says Enoch didn't die. But if you read a little further, in the same chapter of the same book, it says, These all died in the faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So, you know, in the, it just talks about these heroes of the faith. Enoch is listed as one of them. And then it says, these all died in the faith. Well, so if Enoch didn't die, then why does it say he died in the faith? And so that's, you know, some questions we need to look at as well. Um, what verse is that? Hebrews, uh, you're in Hebrews 11? Yeah, Hebrews 11. <laughs> uh, these all died in the faith. Not having received the promises is verse 13. Mm. <clears throat> and then if you skip on down to verses 39 and 40, it says, in these... And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, 
God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. So again, another reference to them uh, not receiving their reward, not being made perfect. Uh, you know, they've all um, they've all seen corruption and, and have not receiving have not received their immortal body yet. <clears throat> And so, you know, there's those are a lot of issues we need to, to examine with Enoch. It's not just as simple as just, oh, God took him to heaven, game over. Um, so the phrase that, you know, it says he did not see death is this. Um, uh, we, we see this, a similar kind of phrase used with Hagar in, um, in the Old Testament. It says, then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a, br- a bow shot for she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat up opposite him and lifted her voice and wept. So she's praying, let me not see the death of the boy. So she understands that he's about to die, but she doesn't want to see his death. She doesn't want to see it coming. She didn't want to experience it. She doesn't want to know about it. So the phrase that he did not see his death doesn't necessarily mean he didn't die. It could mean, you know, maybe he died in his sleep. Maybe he didn't see it coming. He was, you know, it was at a young age, prime of his life. He wasn't expecting it. He wasn't sick. Um, you know, there was no reason to think he was going to die. And then, boom, he's gone. God took him early. He didn't see it coming. He didn't even experience it. It was just, um, you know, this this crazy thing. And, you know, it, it also connects to... Uh, you know, it says that God took him so he couldn't be found. It could be similar to the way with, um, you know, when we look at Moses, uh, you know, it says, uh, it basically says that, that God buried Moses on the mountains and nobody knows where he's at is, is kind of, kind of what the Bible alludes to. Um, and so it's this idea that God, God took him early and he took him away so that nobody could find him. Uh, is, is really all we can get from the scripture to say that God took him to heaven, I think is um, you're imposing your own beliefs on it. You're um, adding to it. You're um, you're making a lot of assumptions when you do that. And there's there's definitely other ways to understand it, especially with the language that's being used um, <clears throat> in the Greek. Uh, it's. Uh... Metathesis, metathesis, I guess. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, it means to change, to remove, to translate. Yeah. Uh, King James says that he was translated, that he should not see death, and was not foul because God translated him. And before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Um, so I... It, you know, I, I do see what it says in verse 13, but this would seem to be the exception. Um, yes, it says these all died in faith. Uh, but, I mean, it's kind of like Genesis 6 where it says that Enoch, I mean, that Noah was uh, righteous or pure in his generations, Tamim. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and that's a word used for genetic purity, same word used for the pure red heifer without spot or blemish. So he, it says that he was pure, uh, but verse 12 says that all flesh had become corrupted. Well, I mean, the verses that say that he's pure seems to be the obvious exception to the, the word all afterward. Um, and I would say the same thing would seem to be the case with Enoch when you look at verse 5. I guess the question would be, what does it mean to be translated? Yeah. Yeah, and and you know that word, um, like you you mentioned earlier with uh, uh, the story of Philip and the Ethiop- Ethiopian eunuch, um, how he was translated or transferred to another location. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely an interesting uh, thing to think about. Um, but you know, with with Enoch, it's one of those things that. Um, there's really not a whole lot of scripture to tell us one way or the other. 
Yeah, uh, the canonized text, uh, of course, that depends on whose canon you're talking about, but in the canonized for the Ethiopians text of the Book of Enoch, uh, I mean, we get a ton of detail about what happens to this guy. Yeah, I know, and and the thing with Enoch, I I know you like the Book of Enoch. Um, I I really have issues with a lot of stuff in there. Uh, basically, I mean, the book of Enoch describes Enoch and it says that, you know, he was so awesome that the angels loved him and wanted him to come be their king is basically the way it portrays it. And, you know, that's, that doesn't fit with the rest of scripture from what I'm seeing. You, 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 does that make sense? Well, I, um, I'm not sure I've ever read that in first Enoch, uh, and second and third Enoch are two books I don't give any credibility to because they're much later Gnostic texts, um, which do talk about him turning into Metatron and, you know, I mean, it just gets really bizarre and crazy in yeah. second and third Enoch. Um, but I, I'm not, ta- I'm talking about first Enoch and I mean, I see the angels, the fallen ones, the watchers of, of Genesis chapter six, um, pleading for him to basically be their attorney, their def- defense attorney, um, which for whatever reason in the text, God seems to be like, okay, sure, no problem. This is what you're going to tell them. Sorry, no, you're not going to be forgiven. You're not going to find any mercy, and here's your judgment. Um, and then he's given, he's taken on a journey where he sees all kinds, although it is interesting, and I'll just go ahead and you know throw this in the mix, the, the flat earth side of things. Um, when you realize that the entire ancient Near East had, including the Holy Spirit-inspired authors of canonized text, had the firm belief in a stationary, still flat world set on pillars underneath a dome within which the sun, moon, and stars were placed on day four, um, then all of a sudden the book of Enoch, especially from chapter 72 forward, starts to make a lot more sense. I mean, if you're trying to fit Enoch into a spinning heliocentric ball cosmological worldview, then Enoch is pure gibberish, um, especially in those latter chapters. But when you consider the enclosed model that the entire ancient Near East, including the Holy Spirit-inspired authors of the Hebrew text of canonized scripture, um, then this little journey he goes on and the things that he sees makes a whole lot more sense. So, But, I, you know, I almost wonder, because, you know, in the text, he's taken, he sees a room that is just terrifying. Uh, I mean, this, this, basically the throne room of God is, is just consumed in flames, and it's, you know, it's just really scary place if you're not one with God. <laughs> uh, I mean, I like the way Doug Hamm talks about it. He basically says, you know, if, if you don't have... The basically the force field that comes with a relationship with Yeshua, uh, then you are consumed in the fire of God, um, which may play into your thesis also uh, as far as being being consumed goes. But regardless, it seems like he's definitely given a, a tour of what appears to be the inner workings of the enclosed world that we call Earth, as well as um, various aspects of heaven. Yeah, I, I I know that there's a lot of stuff in Enoch that's really interesting and, and really makes you wonder. And, you know, there's things that even seem to, you know, help make sense of a lot of other stuff in the Bible. But there's there's just some things in, in the book of Enoch that just makes me go, eh, I, I just, that doesn't fit with the rest of Scripture. And and so, you know, I I wonder if maybe, you know, some of it's been modified or added to. I saw a really interesting study on it. Um some people who originally, you know, were, were all for the whole book of Enoch. And then after like 10 or 15 years of study and stuff, they, they came back and they said, you know what? We don't really think that the entire book of Enoch was really the book of Enoch. We think maybe like this first, you know, couple chapters is about it. And the rest of it may have been, uh, added on later. And, you know, so it's, it's one of those things that it just makes, you know, there's, there's too many questions about it about its authorship, about its, uh, you know, origins and, and things like that. There's things that uh, seem to conflict with other scripture verses. And so I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in it. I just don't put too much weight into it. And I think there's a reason why it, it wasn't in our Bible. And so, uh, you know, again, I think it's interesting, but it, you know, I don't, I don't consider it to be scripture. And so I don't put too much weight into it, especially in those matters. 
one of the things I've wondered is, you know, if, if Enoch was taken to heaven to see all these things, who, who wrote about it? <laughs> well, even in the book of Enoch, it tells you that he did. He wrote supposedly 365 books, and he came back and uh, basically gave them or dictated them to Methuselah, who was to preserve them um, for the coming uh, – at the time of the coming flood. In fact, uh, Josephus talks about that there were two monuments built to hold the ancient knowledge, uh, one that would withstand fire and one that would withstand water. Because he had Adam apparently had a vision of two coming judgments, and obviously the water judgment came first. It's my theory that the Great Pyramid. Uh, I'm not alone in this, or a number of other scholars that believe this also. And uh, in fact, Josephus appears to be one of them. Uh, is that monument built by the sons of Seth, uh, which of course Masusa would be in that line? So you know, I, is that true? I don't know. I mean. I can so, look at the ancient record and say this is what people have been saying, and it appears to be the monument that testifies of God in Isaiah 19 that's on the border in the center of Egypt. So, uh, yeah, we could spend the whole rest of the show debating whether or not Enoch has any real authority. But, I, you know, if we, even if we just put Enoch aside, uh, to me, and I, I had this conversation with uh, John Gabrielson also because he believes the same way you do uh, about a lot of this stuff. And I said, well, you know, Enoch absolutely seems to refute that you know, a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, so, you know, from the other side, you know, taking the contrarian view, it'd be conveniently – it's convenient for you guys to just throw Enoch aside and say, I don't want to look at that. Um, but, okay, fair enough. Let's – it's in well, the interest of not debating Enoch for the rest of the show, looking at the canonized text, he certainly appears to be taken and translated. So I know you've got you've been trying to interject a few times, so I'll, go, I'll let you yeah. go ahead and say. Okay. Um, well, before before we move away from the book of Enoch, I just wanted to to mention something that you know I've I've wondered about, and it what you said kind of ties into it um you know basically what you were describing is he was taken alive up to heaven saw a bunch of stuff came back down told somebody about it or handed him a book or whatever and then was taken back up again basically yeah that's the general concept yeah it would seem like okay. Um, but from, that's where that's the part where because see if you read the book of Joshua, uh, chapter three specifically, gives the reason why he was preferred by God and you know why he was taken and basically the text says that he would spend you know one out of seven days with God and then he started spending two three four and then it got to the point where he basically spent uh, all but one day w- with God and the rest of the time he spent with. With men, and by when I say with God, I mean he would basically would sequester himself away in a prayer closet type scenario, I guess, and basically spend all his time, you know, just with God um, while here on Earth. And then finally, he said, you know, "God's basically like, all right, you're you're closer to my house than your house anyway. Why don't you just come with me?" Um, so it would the implication would be then that. Uh, in his state of worship or whatever you want to call it, that he was with God, that he had the interaction with the watchers and all that that's talked about in the book of Enoch, came back, reported on it, and then it says Enoch was not for God took him, that that's when the the final taking took place. Yeah. Um, You know, what I was, what I was getting to though, was that, um, you know, if that scenario was true, if Enoch, ascended and descended from heaven then you look at some of the scriptures like the ones i mentioned earlier uh in proverbs and and in john where it says you know who has ascended to heaven and who has descended uh you know uh it talks about you know who is the son of god what is his, you know what is god's name what is the son's name who has ascended who has descended um it, it's the way the bible treats it it's like the only person who has ascended or descended from heaven is the son of god Fair enough. It, that, uh, that is true. It, and, uh, do we have a contradiction here? So, so is that a contradiction, or is this saying that Enoch is somehow connected to Yeshua? Is there, you know, that's that's one of those things. Is is, is it a contradiction, or is it showing us something 
else that maybe we hadn't considered before. I, I really don't want to go too much into that, but it's just one of the things that makes you wonder. Um, yeah, that's and, sort of like the Melchizedek argument. Actually. Yeah, I've seen a lot of stuff on Melchizedek too that, that kind of you know talks about how well what was Melchizedek Yeshua in the Old Testament was Enoch Yeshua in the Old Testament. Those are some questions that really we I don't know that we have enough evidence to answer one way or the other. Yeah, I mean Joshua tells you point blank that Shem is the Melchizedek that Abraham encountered. Um, now, of course, people who want to push Joshua to the side and pretend it doesn't exist will bring up things that, that it was a pre-incarnate Yeshua. But the problem I have with that is, if that's the case, then he's a ruling and reigning king on this earth in charge of a few kingdoms for an extended period of time in, mm-hmm. in the flesh. So, so it seems like you, you, know, you jump out of one front pan into another. with. <laughs> yeah, I, I do not think Melchizedek was pre-incarnate Yeshua. I've seen a lot of people say that. I do not think that. Yeah, me neither. But that's one of those times arguments that you come across, and and you know you have to sometimes you have to just kind of take a step back and and examine the evidence and say is that really what the Bible's trying to tell us? And you know does this does this theory conflict with other things in the scriptures? You know, and and that's where I'm at with Enoch. Is you know it's one of the things that came up was you know well was Enoch Yeshua in a different form in the Old Testament? Hold that thought. We're going to break. Come back. Okay. With Robert Bruce, Monday through Thursday on Truth Frequency Radio. And we're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, and tonight I'm talking with my guest for the second time, Lex Meyer, part two uh, of a series we're doing on uh, the topic of his book, Immortal. Um, before we continue, uh, Lex, where can people get your book if they're interested? Okay. <clears throat> you can order it on Amazon. Um, just go to Amazon and look up Immortal by Lex Meyer. Um, or I have a website. It is www.immortal.com thebook.com and then my main website is unlearn the uh, excuse me unlearn the lies.com and there's a link on there to buy the book as well all right very good so before the break uh we were talking about the issue of enoch and where did he go when he was quote-unquote translated was he a pre-incarnate uh, yeshua you know i can't I can't really buy that. I mean, I've heard the arguments, but they're very similar to the Melchizedek arguments. And in the Melchizedek arg- arguments, they'll say, well, see, he has no um, ancestry. You know, I forget the exact quote, but no, no mother or father or whatnot. Um, but my understanding of the order of Melchizedek uh, was that it was, in fact, a king-priest order. And uh, that basically there were king-priests all the way up until Jacob. I believe Jacob was the last king priest, and he split it. It was split up with the priesthood going to Levi and the kingship going to Judah. But prior to that, basically the concept was uh, people of God were they, – they were rulers, and they, they were kings of righteousness, and that they were to pass on that understanding of God to their firstborn, but usually the firstborn missed it for, well, actually not usually, always the firstborn missed uh, all the usual blessings and everything come with the firstborn until Yeshua. Uh, you know, it always went to the second or third or, you know, later generation person. But basically that it was an order that was passed down to the next living 
uh, um, person that could carry it forward. Uh, and so, and, and that, that went all the way back to Adam who had no mother or father. So that was the understanding that I have of uh, the Melchizedek order, you know, and how that could be reconciled with the, you know, he has no. Mother yeah. Mother um, you know, with, with Melchizedek, the Bible doesn't talk about a Melchizedek order or Melchizedek priesthood. It just says that Melchizedek is a priest. Well, it's that Yeshua later was in the order of Melchizedek. Well, or, and, or the likeness of Melchizedek, that he was a, a priest like Melchizedek, in that he had no predecessor and he has no successor, that he's a, he's a priest forever because he lives forever. He has no one to succeed him, and no one was his predecessor. He was the first in line um, when, when he became the great high priest. But, um, you know, back to Enoch, the... The thing I was just talking about, you know, I agree with you. I don't think that Enoch was a pre-incarnate Jesus or, or Jesus in a uh, early form or something like that. I, I don't think that. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I have a big problem with the book of Enoch and with a lot of the lore that surrounds him, including stuff in the book of Jasher. Um, I, I think a lot of it is um, mythological type of stuff that's that, you know, myth that developed about him, people telling stories because... Hey, Enoch was here, and then he got he disappeared. He got taken. We don't know where he went. Let's make up some stories about it. And I, I think that's very likely that that could be where some of the stuff comes from. Um, you know, it's just like the stories of Hercules and the stories of of Zeus and all these these mythological characters. You know, there there are historical things that may have happened, but then there's a whole lot of lore that has developed around it. Uh, you know, I know that there's, you know, there's a lot of connections with the, um, with the pantheon and the Greek gods and, and the ancient gods of the pagans that connects back to the Nephilim. And I know you talk a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's a lot of connections there, but I think that there's also a lot of, of mythology that has surrounded those things and expanded on those stories and, and made it larger than life and bigger than it really was. No, there's no question about that. Uh, and every culture that uh, succeeded the previous one uh, embellished and added their own stuff to it. And, you, you know, it, uh, Zeus becomes Jupiter to the Romans, you know, and they borrow, uh, hey, we like this, what the Greeks had to say. And the Greeks were saying, well, you know, we like what the Egyptians were saying here, so we'll incorporate that. And the Egyptians were saying, well, we like what the Sumerians were doing in the Akkadians, but, you know, we got our own twist on it. So, that, you know, there's no question that the various myths of lots of different cultures borrowed from each other and embellished significantly on it. But it, it, it all it really goes back to Genesis chapter 6, in my opinion, and it says these became the great men of renown. Well, hello. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Um, and But Enoch seems to have credibility, though, in the sense that, I mean, Jude basically cut and paste the paragraph out of it for his book. Um, and there are over, I, I started doing a footnoted and annotated uh, edition of Enoch, which I haven't finished yet, but have well over 200 footnotes uh, already. And, um, I mean, there's no question that the biblical authors of the canonized texts were very familiar with that book. Well, here, you know, one of the things, uh, and you, you should look into this as well, because it's something I haven't looked into too much, but I've looked into it a little bit. Um, there's a lot of scholarship also that says that the book of Enoch may have been backwards written in that, you know, the Bible talks about Enoch and they take all the, the things that the Bible mentions about Enoch and put it in a book and then built a story around it. And yeah, but the problem is the Dead Sea, out, the Dead Sea Scrolls are something like six copies in cave four alone uh, that predate the New Testament by several hundred years. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, it's, you know, it's one of those, like I said, I haven't done a whole lot of research on the book of Enoch, but at this point, I, I don't put too much weight into it. I may change my mind at some point after, you know, some, some more information is presented to me. But right now, it, you know, I, I just kind of see it as it's an interesting story. Uh, you know, there's, there's some interesting stuff in there that, you know, that makes some sense. But I, I just have a hard time saying that Enoch... Uh, was this really awesome guy, and the angels wanted him to come up there and, and you know, lead them or whatever. And it, it also, the problem I have with it is it it exalts him to basically a god status. Yeah, I don't see that in, in book one. Um. <clears throat> no, the fact that he, he gets to go to heaven without dying and live with God for eternity, 
Um, he has, at that point, I guess, apparently already received his immortal body, eaten from the tree of life. He's living forever. Um, he didn't need Jesus to come in and, and save him. You know, he's somehow greater that he didn't need Jesus. And that really causes a problem for well, me. Well, but neither did anybody prior to Jesus. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, they do. They're still buried and dead in their graves waiting for the resurrection. But they... Uh, because, I mean, but, so, so then is your theory that when Abraham rises from the dead, he's going to have to make a conscious decision to, ex- quote-unquote, accept Yeshua? Well, no. He, he had faith before Yeshua came. He had faith towards Yeshua. You know, that, that's why he's the father of our faith. He believed God. So why and, couldn't Enoch have the same thing? Well, but Enoch... All right. To say that Enoch already received his immortal body before Jesus received his immortal, immortal body, he has preceded Jesus. Jesus came, died, and was resurrected. And at his resurrection, he receives an immortal body, and he is crowned the great high priest to that point. And he ascends to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. Yeah, but, it, you know, it just seems like it's, it's, Enoch is a big wild card, man. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. Enoch is definitely a wild card. And Enoch is one that there is, there's not enough evidence one way or the other to say for certain. But, in you know, the things that, that uh, I'm looking at, I, I don't want to put Enoch in a position where he trumps Jesus. Right, I don't think anybody would... And but I think that a lot of that stuff leads in that direction, and that's where I get really antsy about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, you know, you know, at this point, we probably just play ping pong on this for all night long. So let, let's move on to some of the other ones, because um, I've been posting stuff on Facebook, and people have been, "Oh, what about this? What about this? What about this?" Um, what do we do with? Uh, um, I was just thinking about the. Well, hang on. Back up just a second. Also, the the big question is, do we go to heaven when we die? Right. Um, and with Enoch, that is that is a different situation. You know, even if sure, even if he didn't die, even if he did go to heaven, he didn't die. Um, and so, you know, it is a different situation that we're dealing with here. The the big question is, do we go to heaven when we die? Yeah, that's that's the ultimate but, question. And and what you look at when you look at the scriptures. You can search the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and there's not a single verse in the Bible that promises anybody goes to heaven. You know, Nowhere in the Bible. <laughs> I have always struggled with that, too, man. I think we talked about this in the last show. Um, because as I look at Scripture, everything comes down here. I mean, heaven's coming here. Yeshua's coming here. New Jerusalem's coming here. So I was always like, you know, if we do go to heaven, it's a pit stop, Um because it seems like final destination, you know, next stop Earth, <laughs> um, that this place is and always was our place. Yeah. That's why and, the bad guy's got to go. And really, when you look at, uh, you know, we touched on it a little bit uh, last week about how the early church taught resurrection and not going to heaven. But the Gnostics taught you go to heaven, and they, you know, they basically denied the resurrection. Mm-hmm. And... What's interesting is that shift that took place over the centuries. Um, the idea that we go to heaven when we die, when you look at the Catholic Church, what are some of the things that they teach? They say, oh, Mary's in heaven. Mm-hmm. Pray to Mary. She can intercede for you in heaven. Well, that's, that's a flat-out lie. Yeah. Mary is not in heaven. She is dead and buried and waiting in her grave to be the resurrected when Jesus returns. Oh, and the whole the all the are talking to the dead. Yeah, all the saints. I mean, the Catholic Church is all about, you know, go to this saint for this, go to this saint for that. And, you know, of course, Mary, you know, being being the queen of heaven, I'm like, dude, right. do you, like, even read the book of Jeremiah? I mean, he's got some really bad things to say about this queen of heaven business. Right. And so, but the idea that uh, people die and go to heaven is based on this, this uh, cult of the saints, where they are worshiping and praying to the saints. Well... You know, the Bible says you can't talk to the dead, so they say, oh, well, they're not really dead. They're alive in heaven, and so we can talk to them, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says they are dead and buried and in the graves waiting for the resurrection, just like everybody else. When Jesus returns, the dead will be raised, and those who are, are who belong to Christ will be resurrected first, come into his kingdom, reign with him for a thousand years, and then after the thousand years is a second resurrection, 
which is for the judgment, the great white throne judgment, where the reading of the book of life happens. And those whose names are not written in the book of life are going to be cast into the lake of fire. And so we see that judgment has not taken place yet. And so when you die, you are not immediately judged on death. So you don't go straight to heaven or straight to hell when you die. You wait. And you wait until Jesus' return or you wait until the, the great white throne judgment, depending on where your name is in the book of life. And so when people say, oh, well, where's your soul go when you die? Well, why do you think your soul has to go anywhere? The idea that we have an immortal soul is a pagan concept. There's nowhere in the, in the scriptures that says we have an immortal soul. The Bible says that God created man. It says he took the dust and breathed life into it and he became a soul. It didn't say he took this immortal soul and shoved it into a body. That's what the Greeks think. That's what the Gnostics think, that we have an immortal soul that lives forever and we're just trapped inside a, a flesh body waiting to escape. Yeah, you know, when it talks about the conception, um, science has proven that there is this, this light, a spark of light that literally happens at the moment of conception. Do you think that, you know, after God did the initial breathing into Adam and then he took Eve out of Adam and started the whole mechanism of procreation through, you know, sex, that, um, that at the moment a sperm and a, uh, meets with an egg and manages to get in, and that right. spark happens, it, that that's the moment a soul is, uh, comes into existence? I think that's very, very likely. I, I, have no, I have no problem with that at all. I think that's probably a very true statement. Um, because that's the moment when life happens. Conception is the moment when life appears. Yeah. You know, they, they argue about, uh, you know, with abortion, whether, well, you know, is, is, is an abortion murder if it's, you know, pre-birth or if it's, you know, past this certain point or, you know, not past this certain point. When it's conceived, it is life. Mm-hmm. When that spark happens, boom, yeah. life. Yeah, when, when the sperm and the egg join, that is life. That is a human being. And if you if you kill it at any point, you are committing murder. Yeah, I agree. Whether it's born or not, it is murder. And so, I mean, even if it's day two, you know, it, it was conceived, and the very next day you do something to kill it, that is murder. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, okay, well, there's what I started to say um, earlier was there's that interesting passage in 2 Corinthians 12, uh, I'll just go ahead and read it. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. This is Paul talking. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in body I cannot tell or whether out of body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in body or out of body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter, of such a and one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. And Paul talks about, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, and uh, absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. What, what's your take on Okay. So, okay, Paul says, you know, I, I knew a guy who, I, you know, I don't know if he physically went to heaven or if it was just a dream or a vision of some kind, but he was, you know, caught up to, to the third heaven and he saw these amazing things. Some say that he's talking about himself here. That when Yeah, he- some people say that. I don't think so. Um, you know, I think if Paul actually was, was uh, seen a vision or, or taken up to heaven, I think he would say, hey, uh, I had this vision, or hey, I was taken up in bodily form up to heaven. I think he would have a little more clarity on what was actually happening probably mm. and i don't think he would say oh i knew this guy you know it, i i think it was one of these things where he he knew a guy who told him the story and he's relaying the information i don't think he actually experienced it um you know paul is not that humble he's pretty boastful you know he was <laughs> uh you know there's there's a number of times when he boasts about all these different things you know he was circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of benjamin and yeah. the jews a pharisee of pharisees and you know yeah, he gives us pedigree, a pedigree of uh, oh, yeah. on a he number of occasions. He know how much qualifications he has. Um, and so, you know, some people say, oh, he was just so humble. He was, he was you know, passing it off on somebody else. I, I don't think Paul was trying to be humble. I think Paul really just knew a guy who claimed to have gone to heaven. Um, and, you know, wh- you know, he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. 
you know, he's he's qual- he's basically saying, I, I don't know what happened. Um, and but, you know, we, we have other experiences in the Bible records of people who are having visions of heaven. Um, Elijah. I mean, I'm sorry, Enoch. I'm man. Isaiah. <laughs> Isaiah had a vision where he went up and and he went to heaven and the angel touched his tongue with the, the hot coal. And, you know, he talked about how unworthy he was. And, uh, you know, he, he kind of received a commission to go and and uh, talk to people about God. And, you know, this this is a really interesting story about how Isaiah went up to heaven. But it was a vision that he received. We have another vision in, you know, John called the Revelation. He was taken up in a vision and shown all kinds of amazing things, uh, shown things in heaven and on earth, things in the future, all these different things. But again, it was a vision. And so when Paul says, you know, I knew a guy who was taken up to heaven and shown amazing things, I, you know, sure. We have other examples of people who were taken up to heaven in visions and shown amazing things. Um, that doesn't mean that, that they got to live in heaven. That doesn't mean that they are there now. That doesn't mean you're going to go there. And when it's not a, a dying, uh, you know, going back to the original uh, thesis. Yeah. Where, where do we go when we die? And this is interesting. I just, I just noticed this because the word, the phrase caught up in uh, paradise caught my attention there in verse four. That's uh, harpazo. That's the, uh, that's the, that's rapture language there. Um, uh, the same word, harpazo. Uh, but again, it's not a person who died. It's a person who, like he said, I don't know if it was a vision, a dream, whatever. Right. And plenty of people, uh, yeah, I mean, go through a number of the prophets. Uh, Zechariah chapter 3 through 5, there's this whole Yeshua and uh, Zerubbabel deal going yeah. on there. Uh, so, yeah, there are a number of times, even Paul, uh, John, you know, uh, he, when he was caught up um, in a vision. So, yeah, I guess that doesn't really uh, fit the where do you go when you die deal. But what do we do with absent from the body, present from the Lord deal? Okay. Um, hang on just a second. I'm going to look that one up because it is often misquoted. Yeah, I'll look it up too. Let me just pull it up here on my computer. Second Corinthians. Oh, wait. That's not it. Oh, yeah, Second Corinthians 5, 6. Okay, yep. Um, and and 8 also. It says, yeah. and we are, well, I'll just go ahead and read 6th. Uh, yeah, if you've got to pull up, go ahead. I'm yeah. Um, okay. Second Corinthians 5, <clears throat> there, uh, verse 6, Therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, verse 8, we are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Uh, there was another one before that. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. oh, oh, verse 6, therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are... Oh, wait. No, that's not it. Uh, hang yeah, on. The, the last one you read, the, we are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's the verse that people often misquote. They'll say, well, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, that's not what Paul said. That's a misquote. Yeah, let me look at that. I'm going to read that again because, <clears throat> okay, therefore, yeah, it's 6 through 8. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Yeah, so we are willing, and rather, we're, we're willing... Yeah, we, we want to be out of here. want to be out of the body, and to be present with the Lord. Wow! Is this the only verse that says that? or That's the one that everybody misquotes. Yeah, everybody... <laughs> I, I've done it. To be absent from the body, present with the Lord. Yeah. But be, now I'm looking at it again, going... That's not what he's saying, though, is it? And if you look up above that, huh. uh, the very first part of this chapter, he says... Uh, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, and eternal in the heavens. For in his, uh, in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with the house which is from heaven. If 
if so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Uh, for we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not uh, for that we would be unclothed, but clothed, uh, but further clothed, or clothed upon, that morality might be swallowed up by, mortality might be swallowed up by life. And so this is actually, he's describing the same thing he's describing in 1 Corinthians 15. He says that right now we have a body of flesh in 1 Corinthians 15. We have, right now we have a body of flesh, but at the resurrection we're going to receive a, a spiritual body that will live forever, eternal spiritual body. Well, that's what he's just describing here. This house that we currently have, this tabernacle we currently live in, is mortal. And we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with the, the spiritual body that's in heaven. We don't want to be found naked. We don't want to be without a body. You know, we don't want to be some spirit floating around without a body. We don't want to be naked, unclothed. We want to be further clothed with immortality. And so he's talking about resurrection right here. He's, this is they, crazy, I, dude. I'm like flipping out. This is like a Mandela effect going on right here. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I'm going, wait a minute. I know I've seen this first my whole life, but I'm looking <laughs> at it again going, what? Yeah. Well, it's the way I try to describe it to people is, when you are raised up, like, let's just imagine you were raised up Baptist. I was. You were raised up Baptist. You were being taught a Baptist doctrine. Yeah. And so you have a Baptist lens of interpretation. Yeah. It's, it's like a pair of glasses that you look at the scriptures through. For sure. And when you look at the scriptures through this lens of interpretation, you see Baptist doctrine on the Bible. Yeah. But if we can get you to remove that lens of interpretation and just see what the Bible says without any bias, you get a different picture. With so many, I mean, not just this topic. Oh my gosh! Oh yeah, everything, everything. So, so much phenomenal rapture on everybody's understanding of everything. And if we can ever get you to just imagine, like a person who grew up on a deserted island, who has never heard of the Bible, who has never heard of God, uh, doesn't know anything, uh, and you hand them a Bible and say, "Here, read this and tell me about it." And they take this Bible and they read it cover to cover, and they come back and tell you about it you're going to hear a very different story than somebody who was raised up in the church their whole life being taught a certain denominational bias. Oh, that is absolute truth, dude. Absolute truth. When I was a missionary for six and a half years, traveled to almost a dozen countries, these were restricted access countries. And what I found really ticked me off, to be honest with you, because at that phase and that time of my life, I was trying to understand and walk in the gifts of the Spirit because I could see nowhere that it ended. Uh, in fact, I see the exact opposite. I say, you know, hey, those who believe in me will do the same works I've done, Yeshua says, and even greater works, you know, and all this stuff. And so, uh, you know, that we're supposed to still be walking. And well, what would happen is we would go there, our missionaries from Dallas Theological Seminary and whatnot would go to these countries. And in some cases, like in Kazakhstan and some of those other places, uh, there were no known believers in the whole country prior to, you know, the, the missionaries going there. Uh, in recent times. And so they would go there and people would get saved and would, we'd get them a Bible in their in their own language, uh, leave and come back. And, you know, these people are talking in tongues, they're casting out demons, they're healing people, you know, uh, and, and the missionaries would be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. No, 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 no. All that stuff passed away with the apostles. Uh, nope. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, no, come back. <laughs> Initiating the truth frequency. This is Truth Frequency Radio. We're back on the Revolutionary Radio Project for the second hour. I am your host, Rob Skiba, and I'm talking with my guest, Lex Meyer. And uh, right before the break, I was, I was talking about when I was a missionary, 
you know, we get people saved, we give them a Bible, say, hey, you know, read this, you know, and we'll see you later. And we come back and they had just all they did was read the Bible and they were doing the stuff that's in the Bible, in the book of Acts particularly. And then the theologians, you know, seminary graduates were like, oh, 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 oh wait, wait, no, 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 no. You know, all that stuff passed away with the apostles. And, you know, these guys, these blessed saints, you know, uh, first generation believers in some cases are like, you know what, dude, you may believe that, but you told me to read this book. This told this book told me to do this. And, you know, that guy over there was, uh, you know, uh, had a busted leg and now they got healed. And that person was deaf and they could hear. And we cast out three demons out of that person, you know. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. There's no question that that there's a lot of denominational bias that yeah. that people have and they're reading the scriptures with those and man I'm telling you I'm having like this Mandela effect speaking <laughs> moment over here because I'm always you know how many times do we Baptists quote to deliver Christ to die as gain to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and I go back and read this again just it's that indoctrination you wow. know that you keep having to repeat these phrases this mantra that you repeat over and over you hear it over and over and then you start to think, oh, that's what that means. But then when you look at the scriptures and say, well, wait a minute, what does the scripture actually say? And you look at it in its context, let the, let the scriptures interpret the scriptures rather than you interpreting them. Yeah. You have a different conclusion because you're no longer putting on your, your lens of dis- denominational bias and you're just letting the scriptures speak for themselves. Okay, you've got me intrigued. I mean, there's still the Enoch wild card that I'm having some issues with, but... Um, I admit, Enoch is one of those that, that still, I'm not 100% sure what's going on with Enoch. I, you know, and I admit that. Um, and, you know, again, it's again it's dealing with a different situation, though. It's not, he died and go, went to yeah, heaven. it's not a death situation. It, you know, well, what did happen to him? Yeah. Either, either he died, and he's just gone, or he was taken somewhere. Where was he taken? Was he taken to heaven? You know... Is there's just a lot of questions that are not answered in the scriptures? Yeah, unfortunately, you know, and especially if we stick with the canonized text, we have very little to go off of. What about the uh, Hebrews twelve? Therefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Okay, um, he just got done talking in Hebrews eleven about who the cloud of witnesses are. The right. cloud of witnesses are those great men of faith: Abraham, Noah, Moses, Elijah, Enoch. Uh, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all these great men of faith in the scriptures who are witnesses, who have testimony. They are the great cloud of witness who are surrounding us. It's not that they're sitting up in heaven on a cloud watching us. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying that these these great men of old who went before us have given us a witness and a testimony. And they the, their witness and testimony is what surrounds us. It is, oh, I got you. Yeah, they, I see what you're saying. And so he's not. Yeah. watching us. Yeah, that's another one of those denominational bias things that, you know, how many times have I heard this scripture right here, Hebrews 12, 1, that they're all up there watching us. They're all looking okay. down on us. When when you read the, the end of Hebrews 11, it says that they have not yet received their reward, have not yet received the promise of immortality. You know, that they're... Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So th- there's the issue of heaven. But let, let's segue for the second hour here into the issue of hell. And, yeah. you know, you have, uh, well, actually, a really interesting passage of Scripture in line with uh, your unlearned stuff. Um, those of us who are coming into an understanding of Torah and the importance of still, go figure, obey God, uh, uh, still <laughs> obeying God as believers, um, you, you know, we, a lot of us will use... Uh, a scripture like Revelation fourteen twelve. Here is the patience of the saints that they keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I mean, talk about famous right. famous last words. But right before that, we have this scenario. Where it says the same shall drink. Talking about the the bad guys, if you will, shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into a cup of his, the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoso received the mark of his name. Followed up with Revelation 20. 
uh, where it talks about, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we have both the beast, the false prophet, the devil and his angels, and um, those who follow them, it would appear, in verse uh, chapter 14, verse 11, being tormented day and night. Well, first off, it doesn't say those who follow the beast are tormented day and night for eternity. It says that their smoke goes up. The smoke of their torment goes up. The, and it's the, the torment, but they have rest. They have no rest, those who worship the beast. Is that talking about present tense, or is it talking future tense? That they will, they will have no rest, or that they have no rest in worshiping the beast? Uh, so you're saying those who are still living have no rest day or night. Right. And here's let me, let's back up just a second, because I think everybody who's hasn't read the book yet is going, what are you talking about? Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, the Bible says that right now we are mortals. Mortal means that we're going to die. We're not immortals. We're not gods. We're not <laughs> eternal beings. We are mortals. And, you know, there's a number of verses that talk, you know, like John 3, it says that uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Mm -hmm. um, Romans talks about how the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Um, you know, in, in uh, the Old Testament, it says that the soul who sins will die. Um, you know, so over and over, there's a number of scriptures that talk in this type of language. And the punishment that God has bestowed upon mortals mm -hmm. for sin is death. We have a death sentence. And so when you read Revelation and it talks about the, you know, the, the uh, great white throne judgment and the reading of the book of life, and it says those whose names are not written in the book of life are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And so, you know, the first death is when we, when we die, um, you know, the first time, you know, we live our life here on earth and we die and we wait in the grave for the, for the uh, judgment. And then at the judgment, when the, all the graves are opened up, and they go stand before the white, great white throne. And if their name is not but written in the book of life, well, their resurrection has just been revoked. And they are cast into the lake of fire, and they face eternal death. They will never be resurrected again. They are going to be dead once and for all, and that's, you know, there's no more. Um, you know, so they've, they've reached their last chance, basically. And so that's the picture that, that I'm seeing all throughout the scripture is that mortals are going to die and they will not get a chance to live again. Now, what we've, what we've been taught in uh, many denominations is that um, the dead will be kept alive in eternal torment. So that means that God is going to make them immortal in order to eternally torment them and torture them forever. Well, the Bible doesn't say that the wages of sin is eternal torment. It says the wages of sin is death. Right. And, you know, right now, you know, it, it, when you look at Genesis, it says that Adam and Eve sinned, and so he revoked access to the tree of life so that they would not live forever. This was an act of grace by God. He, he did not want them to uh, be eternal ah. beings in sin, eternal sinful beings. That's what Satan is. That's what the fallen angels are. They're eternal beings who have sinned and cannot be redeemed. And so they are going to be eternally tormented. They are not mortals like we are. And so when it says in Revelation that the the beast from the bottomless pit, the uh, the the dragon or Satan, um, and and the the false prophet. Those those beasts from the bottomless pit that he's describing, those are fallen angels. And I know you're very familiar with, with yeah. that concept. Yeah. Abaddon and the abyss and right. Philem and, and the unclean spirits that are produced from all that. Uh, these are fallen angels who are immortal beings. They're going to be tortured 
in the fire forever because they're not mortal. But we are humans. We are mortals. We have not eaten from the tree of life. We have not received our immortal bodies. When we die, when we get cast in the fire, the fire consumes us and we die. And the Bible also mentions the fire that consumes, you know, fire that, that will consume and, and completely destroy. Jesus even talked about it. He said that, um, you know, it's better for you to uh, have your, you know, your right eye plucked out and your hand cut off than for your whole body to be cast into Gehenna fire. <clears throat> And, um, you know, he talks about how uh, don't be afraid of those who can kill your body. Be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Mm -hmm. So he's he's making reference to this fire will destroy both body and soul. That's the type of language that Jesus uses when he's describing this is that it's this fire destroys your body and your soul. Uh, when when we die here on Earth, our body dies, but our soul is not really dead yet um you know it's it's uh kind of it's it's kind of in like this preserved state it's in a waiting state waiting for the resurrection um and to be given a, a new immortal body um but when it you know it hasn't been destroyed it's being preserved god is preserving our soul for the resurrection but in uh the second death our soul is destroyed according to the words of Jesus. And so he doesn't say that your soul is going to be tormented forever. He says it's going to be destroyed. And so, you know, I know there's a lot of, a lot of people who think that God is just going to torture our, you know, friends and family who, who don't believe for eternity. Um, but, you know, I don't think that uh, that concept doesn't fit with scripture first off, you know, because over and over it says, Wages of sin is death. Both the sins will die. We're going to be destroyed in the fire. Numbers of times throughout the scriptures. Um, but then also, it doesn't align up with God's character either. Yeah, I mean, that is one of those big problematic concepts that, you know, well, what about, the, you know, the dude in deepest, deepest, darkest Africa who never had a chance to ever hear anything about Jesus, and because of that, he's going to burn for eternity in hell? What kind of God is that? I mean... Right. That's you know something every Christian has to deal with at some point or another if they've ever had any interaction with anybody in the world, because uh, right. a lot of people think about stuff like that. But I mean, what do you do with like um, Mark chapter nine? And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better that you enter into life maimed than having two hands and go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And it talks about the same thing about your foot and other. That's mentioned several what, times: your eye, your foot, whatever. Yeah. What is what is a fire being quenched? So if you if you go out camping and and you start a fire pit and you get the fire going, get get the fire going really good and hot, and then you decide, oh hey, I'm going to go to bed now and I don't want to leave this fire burning all night. You dump some water on it or you dump some sand on it or something. You quench the fire. Right. But if you let the fire burn all the way till it's done consuming everything in there, it will consume every bit of wood in that fire pit until there's nothing but ash left. That fire was not consumed, or that fire was not quenched. That fire consumed everything. And so there's a difference in, in a, a fire that's not quenched and a fire that never ends. But what's not this? What's fire this that never ends. But what's <laughs> this worm dying now? Okay. What is it? I always wondered about that too. That, when I was a kid, I always freaked out, like thinking, "Wait, does my soul look like a worm?" Yeah, that's actually a reference back to um, I believe it was Isaiah that was talking about the uh, the worm that dies not. Um, it's talking about maggots. When there's dead bodies, the the maggots are attracted to the dead bodies, and well, what does a maggot do? It eats it eats the rotting flesh. And then eventually the maggot turns into a fly and the, the maggot flies off. And so where the worm never dies is, is basically saying that the, the maggots are going to have plenty of food to eat. And they're not going to die of starvation. They're going to they're gonna be able to, to grow in, and to mature into their, their full uh, bodies, basically. And they're going to eventually become flies and fly away. And so the, the worm is not going to run out of food. There's going to be plenty of, of dead bodies for them to, to munch on. 
So you're taking a little, I mean, because this has also been one of those um, denominational bias type scenarios where it, the, the worm dieth not, it was associated with your soul. Yeah, I, I don't think the Bible is describing immortal worms. I mean, if, you know, when you think about it, it's like, what? God's going to make the worms well, immortal? Well, the, the least the way that I had always heard it said that, you know, it was, well, basically, yeah, like, I, like when I was a kid, I thought, well, you know, my my soul must look like a worm. And, and to make matters worse, I, I was I used to collect comic books, and I, I remember uh, there was a series of Conan the Barbarian, and uh, he had this scenario where he had to fight these the souls from hell, and they were all like worms. You know, <laughs> he was being attacked by like these, you know, boa constrictor worms or something. You know, but these were the the, the immortal souls of the damned or whatnot. So you know, it just kind of reinforced that uh, Baptist huh. theology. That's interesting because I've I've actually never heard anyone say that the worm is your soul. That's that's one that I've never heard. That's interesting. Yeah, well, welcome to the screwed up world of a of Baptist. <laughs> but yeah, I I've always I've always heard people say, "Oh, it's just a metaphor," because you know they said the worm never dies. It's a metaphor meaning that you know that the 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 souls never die, the people never die. It's, you know, it's that that's the way a lot of people seem to try to explain it away that it's some kind of metaphorical language. I I think it's being pretty literal i think it's saying that these rotting corpses are going to be eaten by maggots well it, yeah it says where their worm dieth not so i mean it sounds like they have an assigned worm yeah that's yeah, interesting so you don't really no i don't think your soul is a worm <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, what was it, Job 25, 6. Um, how much less a man that is a worm and the son of man which is a worm? Okay. So it's saying that man is a worm. I mean, I guess that's where it comes from. Well, you know, it also says that he that sits upon the, the, the what does it say, the dome of, of earth looks down upon us and we're grass. Well, yeah, fair enough. I mean, we... Are we grasshoppers? Well, no. Well, appear as grasshoppers. That's a appear as grasshoppers. It's a metaf- metaphor. Not- the word "as" indicates it a metaphor. Yeah, but I mean, we're not worms either. We don't. But it doesn't say as a worm. Hurt. It says which is a worm. Yeah. Or who is a worm? Although, it's uh, in King James, which is is italicized. So if I took out the italics, were it would say how much less man a worm, and the son of man a worm. Yeah, I, I think it's that's basically saying that uh, we're, we don't amount to a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you look at some of the other like international standard, it says how much less a, is man who is only a maggot, and a man's children who are only worms. So <laughs> I guess they're saying that you know, yeah, we're nothing. Yeah. So okay, maybe you can't be so literal with it. Um, hmm. <laughs> Okay, well, continue with your your line of thought. So, uh, well, uh, actually, hang on. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of a, uh, a lot of the usual yabbits are escaping me at the moment. <laughs> so, cause I'm still having some of this Mandela effect freaking yeah, but- over here. But uh, so I'll let you just run with it. Um, you know, because it, I mean, this is a huge issue. People are, you know, really freaking out. I mean, not that it's a good thing that you. I mean, the second death. When it talks about the second death, this seems pretty final to me. Uh, whereas you have eternal. I mean, we think of life and death. Yeah, they're, they're diametrically opposed concepts. You know, you're either living or you're dead. And right. with the resurrection, you are resurrected into eternal life. Right. But it describes those who don't receive that as going into a second death. So, I mean, it does. Uh, sir, I mean, if we take the the definitions of resurrection into life and or departure into a second death, it doesn't sound like eternal torment. Right, and that's the you know. There's never any verse in the Bible that says that mortals are going to be tormented forever. What's interesting is it says that. The fire was not even created for mortals. 
Yeah, it was created. The fire was created for the devil and his angels. Right. And so the fire is not even meant for us. Uh, we're not supposed to go there. And it's very unfortunate that some people will go there because, you know, they didn't follow God and they didn't get their name written in the book of life. And so they're not going to end up in the kingdom. They're not going to end up with immortal bodies. They're not going to end up living forever and eating from the tree of life. <clears throat> They're going to end up having to get tossed in the fire, too. But because they didn't eat from the tree of life, they're not going to be they're immortal. The immortal yeah, they're just going to, they're going to, I mean, it's going to be torture. I mean, can you imagine burning to death? That's not fun. Well, yeah, it still sucks. But, I mean, but you know, it, a couple of minutes of torment is a little different than eternity. Yeah, I mean, it may last 10 minutes or an hour or, you know, who knows how long it'll take. But eventually they're going to die and their body's going to be consumed by the fire. But, you know, to imagine somebody who is going to be eternally tormented in fire forever. I mean, what if that's your grandma? Oh, yeah. That's your your daughter or your son or your wife. You know, how can you how can you being in the kingdom and having an immortal body and being eternal in the kingdom have any joy in seeing your son or your mom being tormented forever and ever for eternity while you're eating at the king's table. Yeah, uh, it is a statistic. That's, that's not heaven to me either. No, you know? no. I mean, how, yeah. That's paradise. Right. <clears throat> and so, I, you know, that would be torture to the living as much as it is to the dead. And what does it say? It says that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Well, we're going to have a time of mourning and grieving, but then it'll end. And then he's going to wipe the tears from our eyes and we're going to rejoice in in the uh, the kingdom in paradise with our king, because all old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Yeah, I mean, it, it would definitely stink not to have your loved one with you for eternity. But you know, if they were, if, if you if you saw, you know, that they were cast into the lake of fire, uh, but then disintegrated you know, burnt up, I mean, yeah, it would, there would still be a, a loss to mourn, but that would be a heck of a lot different than knowing every yeah. second of eternity they are in unbearable torture. Right. I mean... And, and again, that, you know, the idea that God would create, uh, basically take a mortal and make him immortal just for the sake of torturing him, that is an assault on God's character. Yeah, And so when people say that, yeah, that's what God's going to do. He's going to take this mortal, make him immortal, and keep him alive forever and torture him forever and ever and ever. That's an assault on God's character. You know, we, you know, the Bible talks about how we have a loving father who wants the best for his children. No father wants to see his children tortured forever. It's hard enough to spank your kid. It's hard enough to put him in time out or, or to ground him or to take away a toy from him. I mean, you know... Punishing your child is not fun for the father either. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, you know, it's like saying, oh, well, you know, yeah, God loves you, but he's going to he's going to punish you and torture you constantly for your entire life. Yeah, your dad loves you so much. He's going to constantly punish you and torture you your entire life. What? That's not love. You know, no, no father wants to do that. God loves his children and he wants the best for him. And he doesn't want to punish us, but when he when punishment has to come, he will punish us. But it's as much torture to him as it is us. And he's not going to keep us alive for eternity just to keep torturing us, like it's something he gets you know he gets enjoyment out of. What about I mean, <clears throat> to, that's, that's why he took away access to the tree of life so that he didn't have to do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've talked about that too. That that was a an act of mercy on Adam and Eve huge act of mercy i'm so thankful that we don't have access to the tree of life yet yeah but you know i look forward to the day when we do have access to it because that will be amazing yeah but i mean do you think that going back to the deepest darkest africa argument those who never ever had a chance i mean it's one thing to hear and reject i think i think everybody would agree on that you know, if you, you hear the truth and you say, nope, not for me, I, you know, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, I mean, you're making a choice. 
But somebody who doesn't even know what the conversation is about, never heard it, n- knows nothing about it, never had the opportunity to even m- consider a choice, do you think that, that in the resurrection they are given an opportunity? Well, I, you know, I would hope so, but there's, the Bible doesn't tell us. Yeah, we're what, speculating either way. It's, it's, it's going to be speculation. Any guess we make at this point is just a guess. Um, I just, you know, I have faith and I trust that God is wiser than I am. And he's going to make the best decision and the best choice. He's a righteous judge and he's going to make righteous rulings and he's going to do what's right. And he, you know, he's not going to um, punish someone unjustly or unfairly. And so, you know, I trust him to make the right decisions, and, and he's going to do what is best. And you know, we all we can do is, is hope for the best, you know, and, and, and know that it's in good hands. Uh, well, um, man, there's, there's just a bunch of my brain's all jumbled up with a bunch of questions and stuff I'm trying to sort sort through but uh, well The Covert Report with Susan Lindauer Saturday and Sunday on Truth Frequency Radio Um, okay, now it's telling me I'm on the air again. <laughs> okay, well, I apologize to anybody out there listening. I never heard the sound for the commercial break. And um, anyway, well, it looks like we're back in business again. So welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, for the final segment. I'm talking with my guest, Lex Meyer. And i um, not sure where we got cut off before the break, but uh, you were talking about uh, at a funeral, and you were like, where is that in the Bible? And... You know, uh, maybe you can take it from there again. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I was at my uncle's funeral, and, and he was talking about heaven and and how my uncle was in heaven, and and I just started wondering where does the Bible even say anything like that? You know, it doesn't say we're going to go sing with the angels and walk on the clouds, and and all, you know, where does it say any of this stuff? And you know, I've read the Bible a number of times, and I I've never read a verse that says that when you die you're going to go up and you know be with the angels and and Play harps with God, yeah. Play harps and walk on streets of gold and and dance on the clouds and look down on your relatives who are still alive and all this stuff that people say at funerals that is no scriptural basis whatsoever. And so I just started digging into the Bible and trying to figure out what does the Bible say about death. And that's when I started stumbling across the resurrection and, and how prevalent the resurrection is throughout the scriptures and how important it is. It's it's like the key message of the gospel. When you look at Acts, I'm sorry, First uh, Corinthians 15, Paul says, you know, this is the gospel message, and he talks about how you know Jesus uh, lived and died and was resurrected and was witnessed by 500 people, and then he goes on and, and he starts talking about our resurrection, all in the same chapter as part of his gospel presentation. You know, Jesus died and resurrected, and you're going to die and resurrect too. Basically, is what he's saying and you know if you deny the resurrection then you know you're denying christ is is some of the language that he's using in first corinthians 15 and you know i noticed also in philippians he talks about you know he wanted to uh, he counted everything loss in order to uh, attain the resurrection that you know that he might attain the resurrection it's the goal that he was striving for and you know all throughout acts the apostles are, are talking to other people about the resurrection and, you know, the hope of the resurrection is Jesus came back from the dead, so we can too. Um, you know, de- death is not final. You know, it's not, it's not the last drive. When we die, it's not over. We, got, we have another chance. And through the resurrection of Jesus, we have potential possibility to be resurrected. And, you know, when you start realizing that that's what this message is of the gospel, that, you know, we can die and live again, then you read scriptures like John three, uh, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever lives, 
or whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so when you start realizing that eternal life equals resurrection, and you start looking through all these different verses that are talking about eternal life and immortality and living forever and, and all these different things, you start saying, wow, this is, this is all over the Bible. <clears throat> Even back in, in Deuteronomy, when you have um, the blessings and the curses, and he says, you know, um, if, if you do these things, you'll be blessed. If you don't do these things, you'll be cursed. And you start looking at blessings and curses throughout the scripture. You know, even starting back in Genesis, the, you know, the very first blessings and curses that you see in the Bible. Well, what, what does he say? He blessed them and told them to be fruitful and multiply. So the blessing was life. Blessing is equals life. And then you look at well, what was the first, what was the curse that he gave him? Well, he cursed her womb so that she would have pain in childbirth. It was something that hinders or, or makes life um, more difficult. And then you see, okay, well, he, um, you know, he blessed the earth and it was fruitful and multiplied. And the curse that he gave Adam was that, oh, well, now there's going to be thistles and thorns and you're going to have to work hard for the earth to produce fruit. It's stuff that stifles your life. And then, you know, you see things like um, women who are barren, <clears throat> they're considered to be cursed. And then if they have children, they're considered to be blessed and you know, all these different things, you start seeing this theme of blessing and curses throughout the Bible is, is life and death. And then so when you look at the New Testament, when he's talking about blessings and curses, you know, in, in the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are those who are poor for theirs is uh, for great is their reward. Blessed are you who mourn for you will be comforted. Blessed are you who um, are persecuted, uh, you know, and because great is your reward and in, in heaven and, and so all these different things where he's talking about blessings and curses and when you realize that the eternal blessings and the eternal curses are tied into that as well <clears throat> and so when you are blessed by God your eternal blessing is that eternal life you're going to have life abundant and eternal and if you're cursed by God then that life is going to be taken away from you yeah um Revelation 20 talks about when the first resurrection happens. And that is at the end of the tribulation, in the beginning of the millennial reign, when Satan is locked up for a thousand years. You know, that whole end times has not happened yet. Deal. But what about Revelation 7, uh, verses 9 through 15? After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in, with palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever." And ever, amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these that are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto them, unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. This appears to be before that first resurrection scenario. Well, no, because what you just read said that they came through the tribulation. Well, fair enough. It says after the tribulation. Well, it doesn't say after. It says came out of. Some yeah. say they're martyrs. Well, but when when you realize that Revelation is not written chronologically, I do realize that. And so, what he's describing, he's describing different events, and some of these events overlap each other. But he tells them, you know, like he says, okay, here's these bowls. Let me tell you about these bowls. Right. Oh, here's these lamps. Let me tell you about these lamps. Right. Here's the horses. Let me tell you about these horses. And so he's going through these different things. And what, what you know, we may not realize is the first lamp, the first bowl, the first horse, you know, all these things may be happening simultaneously. And so when he gets to the end of the whole thing, he's just described this huge picture of all these events that are taking place. They could be all taking place simultaneously or, you know overlapping each other and, and various things like that. You know, a trumpet blows and a bowl is poured out and a, a horse runs free. Um, you know, all these different things. And so when you try to, to say, well, 
<clears throat> excuse me, um, the chapter seven is before the resurrection. I, I don't think that's true. I think it is describing the event of the resurrection. Um, I think he's saying that at the resurrection, he's going to see 144,000 from the tribe uh, from the 12 tribes of Israel and a great multitude who are brought before the throne and who are resurrected. And these are uh, the people who are welcomed into the kingdom and they serve in the kingdom. When you look at Revelation 20, what does it say? That after the tribulation, it says what? That uh, Yeshua is going to return and the dead are going to be raised and that they will serve him in his temple day and night. And he's going to reign for a thousand years. And so you have the same scenario that's being described. Yeah, Doug Hamp and I did a whole series. We haven't finished yet. We were going line by line through the book of Revelation. And uh, both of us came to the same conclusion that it's definitely a nonlinear book. Um, and we described it as basically John's entered into the video control room of heaven, where if you've ever been in a video control room, you, it's just full of monitors. And he's doing the best he can to describe everything he's seeing but, you know, with all the events that are going on <laughs> yeah he's looking at one monitor goes oh blah 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 and then i saw you know he looks in the next monitor and blah 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 and so we were looking for sync points where you where you where you could see pretty obvious in, in our opinion overlays where you know this is talking about the same thing as this is talking about so i'd have to see if there's a, a revelation 7 and a 20 overlay there because right before this verse 9 it's talking about the 144,000 being sealed. Yeah. Uh, so that's still clearly during tribulation. Uh, and, of course, he says, and after this I beheld. So is he then switching and looking at the other monitor over here that overlays with Revelation 20? I'd have to go back and look at that again. But, I, again, we come back to this, how many first resurrections are there? Right. I mean, if there's only one resurrection and it hasn't happened yet and it doesn't happen until after the tribulation, then... This would have to be an overlay with Revelation twenty. That's the conclusion I have as well. That um, that they, you know, if they're if they're uh, living and standing before God and serving Him in His in His temple, then they've been resurrected. Well, the resurrection happens after the tribulation, and it says that these came through the tribulation. So, therefore, I conclude that this event happens after the tribulation when Yeshua returns and the dead in Christ are resurrected, and those who belong to Him enter His kingdom at that point. Whereas the rest of the dead remain in their graves until the second resurrection and the judgment. Yeah. So that's the conclusion I've come to on Revelation 7 as well. Well, uh, what kind of uh, feedback have you had so far? I haven't read your book yet. Uh, I have a digital copy of it. but uh, And I, I have had some amazing uh, feedback. If you, you can just go to Amazon and read some of the reviews that people have written. It's very, very positive, very encouraging. Um, I, I think every one of them so far has been, that you know, I haven't been there recently to look. There may have been somebody post a new one, but uh, the last time I looked, every single one of them was just, you know, awesome uh, reviews for the book that, they, you know, they loved it. I've had, uh, you know, several people tell me that they read the book, got to the last page, flipped it over and started again and read it through a second time. And then I've had several people tell me that they loved the book so much that they wanted to go buy copies for everybody they knew. And they went and bought, you know, copies for, for all their friends and family and, and handed them out. And so I've had so many people tell me that this book has just been amazing and that they've, that they've loved it and they wish everybody would read it. And so it's very encouraging, very positive, and, and uh, I really appreciate all the, the wonderful feedback everybody's given. Yeah, it came with... Uh... A lot of uh, positive reviews when I first heard about it. Uh, people were like, dude, you're going to have to read this book. And um, and it came on the heels of my friend John Gabrielson writing a, a, about – his whole book wasn't about specifically this, although he did deal with it in his book. And uh, he and I had some – quite a number of conversations about this stuff. It's something I'm going to have to chew on for a while, but I mean, you know, it's like everything else. I'm 46 years old and had a whole lot of other stuff crammed in my head that I'm having to rethink too, so why not add this to the pile? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, um, if you don't have anything further, I've got an interesting one I want to bring up for you. Yeah, sure. we got about 15 minutes left. Take, it, take us wherever you want to go. Okay. Um, 
there's an interesting conversation that happens in the Gospels where uh, Yeshua is talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, and uh, they bring up a, a difficult question. They say, you know, this woman, um, she's been married multiple times. I think it was like seven times. And then she dies, doesn't have any kids. Whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? Mm-hmm. And it's the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. The Pharisees do. Sadducees are asking this question, um, trying to trap him, basically. And so it's a really interesting thing. And it says that um, uh, the way he explains it is really interesting. And it's often misquoted. And, you know, he says that uh, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given a marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Mm -hmm. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. And I can't... I, I can't even count how many times people have told me, oh, well, we live in, you know, when you die, you go to heaven because God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. That is not at all what Jesus just said. He said concerning the resurrection of the dead. Yeah, which, God, which God, is God. the big thing. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. And if you study, you know, I, know, I know you've looked into a lot of ancient uh, religious beliefs and things. And if you study a lot of ancient religious beliefs, you realize that that, that the ancient religions, the Egyptians, uh, the the Greeks, various other ancient religions would teach that when you die, you go to be with your God. You know, you go to, to the place of your God. And so they would go to uh, the underworld or they would go to, uh, you know, up to the heavens or, or wherever, you know, if, if you're worship Thor, you're going to go to be with him in Valhalla. Mm-hmm. You know, all these different religious beliefs of the pagans they believe, well, they also taught that there is a God of the dead, you know, so if you you study Egyptian theology, well, who is the God of the dead? Well, there's Osiris, Anubis, right? right? Anubis, Osiris, yeah. Yeah, Anubis, Osiris, um, there's another one too, wasn't there? Well, Anubis was the reigning God of the underworld until Osiris showed up and basically usurped him and yeah. gave him other, other duties. Didn't he become like his servant or something? Yeah. At that he's, point, yeah. He's based, when you go there uh, to Hades, you're, he quizzes you uh, to sit, see which direction you end up going, you know, weighing your weighing your soul against the feather, and you know all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and you know, there's even the Book of the Dead, the Egyptian right. Book, that you know talks about a lot of that kind of stuff. And so, well, when he says, "Our, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not the God of the dead; he's the God of the living." You don't go to be with him when you die. Oh, that's an interesting. Take. And when you're alive, that's when interesting. You're resurrected. Because he says, concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read? God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of the living. So he's talking about the resurrection. He says that it, you don't go to be with God when you die. You go to be with him when you are resurrected. Because he's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. Yeah. Yeah, Walter Weiss' video, he makes a really good uh, point in that regard, talking about, you know, um, Basically, the contrast between the God of the living and the God of the dead. That that and he does the whole Osiris thing, and which plays into a lot of my um, research for my first book and uh, Nimrod and the end times and Antichrist and you know all that stuff. And how I mean, he is in so many ways a direct antithesis of our God. Yeah, and yet so much of that theology, if what you're saying is true then so much of that God of the dead theology has made its way into the Christian faith. Yeah. Also, another one is uh, the gates of Sheol, or the gates of Hades. Yeah. You know, it's a phrase that there's, it's used a couple times, you know, like three or four times in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Um, but one specifically is when uh, Yeshua was talking to his disciples, and, you know, he says, uh, you know, who, who do you say that, or who do other people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And, uh, you know, Peter answered and told him that, you know, you're, you're, this, uh, you're the son of God. And he says, blessed are you, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is heaven. And I say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of 
Sheol shall not prevail against it, or the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And when you realize, okay, what is the gates of Hades? You start looking at some of the places where it's used in the Old Testament. Um, and it says that uh, they, you know, uh, they, will, uh, they will go down to the gates of Sheol. Shall, will they go down to the gates of Sheol? Shall we have rest together in the dust? Um, that's in Job. Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the doors of the shadows of death? In the prime of my life, I shall go down to the gates of Sheol. I am deprived from the remainder of my years. Um, have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me. You who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of your praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in your salvation. And then, uh, and their soul aboard all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. And so we see, you know, all these different verses that talk about the gates of death, the gates of Sheol, gates of Hades. Um, what do gates do? That's gates, you know, when you think about a fence around your yard, your gate is the entrance to your yard. It's also, uh, you know, it, it allows people to enter and it also prevents people from entering. It allows people to leave, but it prevents people from leaving. It's, it's the doorway in or out. And so if the gates of hell will not prevail against us, what does that mean? When we die and we go to, or, you know, the gates of Hades or the gates of Sheol will not prevail against us. When we die and we go to Hades or Sheol or death or the grave or, you know, whatever it's talking about there. Um, you know, when, when we die and we go to the grave, when we go to Sheol, when we go to Hades, the gates are not going to prevail against us because we're going to resurrect. We're going to get out. And so upon, blessed are you, Simon Peter, for upon your testimony, I will build my church and the gates of Sheol will not prevail against it. My church will prevail over death is basically what he's saying. Hmm. Those who follow me will prevail over death. They will get through the gates of Sheol. The gates of Sheol will not hold you back because you're going to be resurrected. And so even phrases like that have so much depth when you realize what, you know, the, the significance of the resurrection in the gospel message. You know, I can hear some people saying, okay, what does any of this matter? Uh, you know, uh, I mean, if I believe in Yeshua, great. You know, it's not a salvation issue. Well, you know, kind of is a salvation issue because if you're not saved, then you're not going to resurrect. But, I mean... What would you say is the most significant takeaway from all of this research that you did? Um, well, I, I really think the resurrection is the most significant thing that I've took away from it is the just the awesomeness and the importance and the prominence with which the scripture writers wrote about the resurrection. And the fact that it's been ignored and pushed aside and replaced with pagan theology that says you die and go to heaven. The Bible says that God seeks people who will worship him in spirit and truth. And that's the, that's the foundation of, of my whole ministry is seeking truth. You know, we have inherited lies, Jeremiah says, you know, that the Gentiles should come to you from the ends of the earth and say, our forefathers have inherited lies worthless and unprofitable things we have inherited lies from our ancestors and we are supposed to be worshiping god in spirit and in truth and so we need to be seeking out the truth in all things and so when we find the truth um you know the truth will set you free that's what you know that's what jesus taught is you know the truth will set you free and so the more the more truth that we discover in the scripture the more freedom we have in Messiah. Well, I, I mean, I could see, well, at least for myself, uh, truth setting me free uh, in the sense that if what you're saying is true, then the whole people, loved ones, suffering for eternity in hell is, and, and if we can... Sit, sit, don't you? 
Yeah, if, if, well, if we could safely and legitimately toss that whole idea out, there's a, a lot of freedom and rejoicing in that, even though there's still a loss, uh, you know, if your loved one's not going to be with you for eternity, um, you know, not being with you because they've been obliterated is still a lot better than knowing that they are in torment. But what do we do with... I hear people on Facebook, you know, or, or see people texting stuff on Facebook. What about all the testimonies we supposedly have of people who claim to have died and gone to either heaven or hell? Yeah, I actually had one just like this week. Uh, this lady get, got on my page and, and posted a comment on something I wrote. And she, she commented like, you know, like a hundred times. I mean, over everybody's comments, she would comment and say, oh, I went to heaven. I went to heaven. I went to heaven. And, you know, she, her claim was that she, she didn't die. She just went to heaven, got to go up there, meet Jesus. He put a crown on her head. They had a wedding ceremony. He called, he changed her name to Jerusalem. And so now she's Jerusalem apparently. Hmm. And then she came back down. And then later on she had a, you know, same, you know, same type of experience. She apparently went back up to heaven and got to hang out with Jesus some more and, and she got to see what God looks like. And, and you know, it's just this really ridiculous story that doesn't go any, it doesn't line up anything with Scripture. And, you know, she's basically claiming that, you know, she married Jesus. And so she's the bride of Christ. And her name is Jerusalem now. And so she's the new Jerusalem. And, you know, when you ask her about it, you know, you say, well, you know, was, you know, do you think maybe this was just a vision or something? She says, oh, no, no. It's not a vision. I really went to heaven, and I really saw Jesus, and I really saw God, and it. The story is just ridiculous, and and I'm I'm thinking, okay, either you're on drugs, or you're crazy, or you know this is some kind of demonic deception, and you know I you know, I don't know what's going on with this person. You know, maybe she had some kind of a, a dream or vision. Maybe she was hallucinating. I I don't know, but. For her to claim that she actually went to heaven and she had a wedding ceremony with Jesus while she was there is pretty preposterous. And, you know, I just I just can't believe people even buy some of the stories that they tell. And, you know, you have the story about, uh, you know, the little boy that, that went to heaven and and um, you have other stories. And then people have written books and, and movies and things about all these different stories about people going, dying and going to heaven and coming back. Hang on, we got. Looks oh. like looks like we're about to end right here. I just did oh. the clock and oh, oh, we got like twenty oh. seconds. Well, um, I don't believe them. <laughs> fair enough. Well, there you go. Uh, thanks for coming on, Lex, and thank you guys for listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project. And we'll see you back uh, next week, uh, same time, eleven p.m. Central Standard Time. Good night, everybody. And if you want to learn more about what Lex has to say regarding this subject, check out his book. You can get it on Amazon uh, or through his website. And, uh, you know, this is one of those subjects that uh, I think Lex makes a compelling argument, although I come from a different perspective and have had a different point of view my whole life. He's given me something to think about. And uh, to sort of balance this discussion a little bit with perhaps a, a contrary point of view. Uh, I'm going to play some clips from one of two videos that Steve Mutria did on the subject called Pharisees and Sadducees, just so you can weigh the merits of both arguments and go to the Father and pray uh, for discernment as to what the truth is. Uh, you know, this may be a, an important issue. I hope Lex is right, to be honest with you. But I have a lot of the yeah buts going on in my head, and Steve articulates them well in his counter-argument, and so I'm just presenting this here for you to be able to sort of hear both sides of the story, uh, so you can make your own decision. You can check out the complete videos on YouTube or at uh, TorahFamily.org. Uh, if you go on YouTube, just search for Pharisees versus Sadducees, part uh, 1 and 2. Uh, so, I'm just going to play about 25 minutes worth of part 1. If you want to watch the rest of part 1 and watch part 2, you can do so on YouTube. All right, so uh, here we go with Steve Mutria's counter-argument to this issue of what happens when we die. Hell is a topic of much discussion. 
much debate, and much disagreement. I've been asked for some time to examine this topic and see what I come up with. It's kind of interesting when seeing what's going on today. It's almost like believers today are divided like the Pharisees and the Sadducees were. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits. But the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Though most believers today do indeed believe in the resurrection, there seems to be two different groups nonetheless. There are those who believe we are non-existent at death, or considered to not have consciousness at death, similar to the Sadducees. Then there are those who believe our spirits live on in consciousness after our physical death, like the Pharisees. So again, it's almost like believers today are divided like the Pharisees and the Sadducees were. Thus, the title of this teaching, Pharisees versus Sadducees. That being said, this is not a topic to divide over. If people disagree with one another, then they simply disagree. I've actually avoided this topic for some time because of the sharp stances that so many hold to on it. But with all the inquiries that I've received for a teaching on it, I thought I would look into it and see if I could at least narrow down some of the debate or bring up new thoughts to consider. This teaching will be separated into two parts. The first part will consist of two one-hour teachings that will cover the topic of what is commonly called hell and what happens immediately after one's physical death. Part two will cover the second death, that being the nature of the lake of fire. Will it be a place of eternal torture or a place where one is literally done away with by simply burning up? These two topics have been debated for centuries. So how do we address this topic without offending someone? Well, we really don't know, simply because the beliefs on this topic are held with much passion for some. Yet, this is not a topic that will decide one's eternal fate, even though, ironically, that is the very topic at hand. This should not be a topic that believers divide over. The purpose here is to show that we believe there are plausible defenses to this topic that should not be quickly overlooked. We ask that you keep an open heart as we examine these views and ponder some that have never been considered. Chapter 7 Rested with Their Fathers We have often read the phrase, rested with their fathers. When we hear this, we often hold the image in our mind of them literally being buried together. Though this was indeed a practice back then, is it something we can assume for this phrase every time it is mentioned? Consider the word spoken to Abraham. Genesis 12.1 Yahweh said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. Five verses later, we read, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Yahweh appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to Yahweh, who had appeared to him. So Abraham leaves everything behind and travels a long distance, and is promised the land for his descendants. However, three chapters later, we see this. Genesis 15, 15. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. Here we see that Abraham would go to his fathers and be buried at an old age. Are we to believe that Abraham would be physically buried with his fathers in the land he came from? Many have believed that this actually did mean he would be buried with his fathers. But again, we know that Yahweh told Abraham to leave his family and go to another land. That being said, consider the following two verses. Genesis 23, verse 19. Afterward, Abraham buried his wife Sarah in the cave of the field of Machpelah, near Mamre, which is at Hebron in the land of Canaan. Then, two chapters later, Genesis 25, verse 10. 
the field Abraham had bought from the Hittites. There, Abraham was buried with his wife, Sarah. So, here we see that Abraham was not physically buried with his fathers, but was actually buried in the land of Canaan. That being said, what do we do with what Yahweh said to him in Genesis 15? Again, Genesis 15, 15. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. Could this not mean that Abraham, though physically buried in Canaan, indeed went to be with his fathers spiritually? Is this not equal with the parable that Yeshua gave regarding the rich man and Lazarus? Though they were physically buried, their spirits went somewhere else. We'll come back to that parable a little later. But we can see here that there may be a legitimate perspective in understanding this view. Are there other accounts that could bear witness to this? <laughs> Quite possibly so. Consider the account of Aaron's death. Numbers chapter 20. Aaron will be gathered to his people. He will not enter the land I give the Israelites, because both of you rebelled against my command at the waters of Meribah. Get Aaron and his son, Eleazar, and take them up Mount Hor. Remove Aaron's garments and put them on his son, Eleazar. For Aaron will be gathered to his people. He will die there. Moses did as Yahweh commanded. They went up Mount Hor in the sight of the whole community. Moses removed Aaron's garments and put them on his son, Eleazar. And Aaron died there on top of the mountain. Then Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. And the whole community learned that Aaron had died. The entire house of Israel mourned for him 30 days. Three people went up the mountain. Only two came down. Aaron was buried on top of Mount Hor. Yet, his people were buried all over. So, how was Aaron gathered to his people as Yahweh said? Consider also the account of Moses. Numbers 31. Yahweh said to Moses, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the Israelites. After that, you will be gathered to your people. Deuteronomy 32, verse 50. There on the mountain that you have climbed, you will die and be gathered to your people, just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. The phrase, gathered to your people, could not mean that they were buried together. No one knows where Moses was buried, but we know that he was indeed buried in Moab and not on Mount Hor with Aaron. Deuteronomy 34 And Moses the servant of Yahweh died there in Moab, as Yahweh had said. He buried him in Moab, in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Thus, he was not buried with Aaron, yet he was gathered to his people just like Aaron was. So, they were not buried together, but were both gathered to their people. Again, this seems to show that they were indeed spiritually gathered to their people. The place that Yeshua referred to as Abraham's bosom, referred to as Sheol in the Tanakh. After all, Yeshua cannot contradict the scriptures, but rather we see that he expounded on them to give us clarity. Chapter 8 King Saul and Samuel If the Hebrew understanding was that all simply fall asleep or become non-existent until the resurrection, why would King Saul entertain the thought that the dead could be contacted? If every Hebrew knew the dead were in some kind of non-conscious state, none of them would attempt to reach out to the dead. That would never be a temptation for them. King Saul's account is given to us in 1 Samuel 28. It's where he goes to a medium to call up the spirit of Samuel in desperation. Consider the account. It's a little long, but I believe it's necessary to cover. 1 Samuel 28, starting in verse 3. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. 
and Saul had removed from the land those who were mediums and spiritists. So the Philistines gathered together and came and camped in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they camped in Gilboa. When Saul saw the camp of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of Yahweh, Yahweh did not answer him, either by dreams, or by Urim, or by the prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman who is a medium at Endor. Then Saul disguised himself by putting on other clothes, and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and said, Conjure up for me, please, and bring up for me whom I shall name to you. But the woman said to him, Behold, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off those who are mediums and spiritists from the land. Why are you then laying a snare for my life to bring about my death? And Saul vowed to her by Yahweh, saying, As Yahweh lives, there shall no punishment come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid, but what do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a divine being coming up out of the earth. And he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is wrapped with a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed his face to the ground and did homage. Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am greatly distressed, for the Philistines are waging war against me, and God has departed from me and answers me no more, either through prophets or by dreams. Therefore I have called you, that you may make known to me what I should do. And Samuel said, Why then do you ask me, since Yahweh has departed from you and has become your adversary? And Yahweh has done according as he spoke through me, for Yahweh has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, to David. As you did not obey Yahweh and did not execute his fierce wrath on Amalek, so Yahweh has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, Yahweh will also give over Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines. Therefore, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Indeed, Yahweh will give over the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Whether you want to believe that this really was Samuel or not is up to you. However, there is nothing to indicate that it wasn't, and if you notice, in this account, Samuel only declares what was in accordance to the word of Yahweh. But the interesting thing to note is that King Saul knew he could do this. This is important to understand. His understanding of the afterlife was not that you are in some non-conscious state until the resurrection, but rather that the spirit goes somewhere. Here we see that Samuel came up from somewhere. It said he came up from the ground. With this, we see the understanding of what is given to us about Korah and his family going alive into Sheol in the book of Numbers. Number 16. They went down alive into the grave, Sheol, with everything they owned. The earth closed over them and they perished and were gone from the community. The word for earth here is the same as in 1 Samuel 28 in the account of Samuel coming up. The Hebrew is aretz, meaning land or ground. So, even here we see the understanding of Sheol being down under the ground. Please notice what Samuel said to Saul at the conclusion here. He said, Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. 
This is indeed in harmony with what we mentioned earlier about Abraham, Aaron, and Moses going to be gathered to their people. Also, please note that Samuel knew nothing of what was taking place on the earth since he had died, showing all the more that the verse in Ecclesiastes that so many refer to can apply to those here as well. Ecclesiastes 9.5 For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. Indeed, the dead know nothing of what is taking place with the living on earth. And indeed, there is no more opportunity for one to build reward for themselves in the eternal kingdom. Chapter 9 God of the Living All that has been mentioned flows with the words of Yeshua as given in the book of Mark. It's chapter 12 where we see the Sadducees give Yeshua a question regarding the resurrection. Mark 12, 18 Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him with a question. Now, if they didn't believe in a resurrection, one can't help but wonder what they believed would happen to someone when they died. Did they believe that we just go back to the dust and are no more at all? That would almost seem to be the case if we consider the response Yeshua gave them. Compare Mark 12, 24. Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? When the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Again, verse 27. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Yeshua declares that the Sadducees were badly mistaken and declares Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to actually be living and not dead, even though everyone knew they were dead physically. He declares them to be living. He declares Yahweh the God of the living based on the following words from verse 26. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So when Yahweh spoke to Moses, he declared he was the God of the living at that moment of the burning bush, according to Yeshua. He did not declare himself the God of those who will be eventually living. Again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. This explains verse 24, where Yeshua said they were wrong on two things. Verse 24, Jesus replied, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? They were in error because of two things. These two things were not knowing the scriptures and not knowing the power of God. Not knowing the power of God would seem to be that of not knowing Yahweh's ability to raise the dead. Not knowing the scriptures would seem to show that they believed Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were dead and not living at the time when Yahweh spoke to Moses through the burning bush. It would seem that they believed the dead were in a non-existent or non-conscious state. Regardless of what they believed, Yeshua's answer implied that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were indeed alive at the time of the burning bush. This parallels what we've seen regarding that of Abraham, Aaron, Moses, and Samuel, along with Saul and his sons. They were very much alive as they went to be with their people, as Yahweh said. 
Yet, the belief of living on after our physical death is also revealed in the event that is often referred to as the Mount of Transfiguration. Compare Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Many bring up that this was just a vision, and so Moses and Elijah really didn't appear from the dead. And we believe this is quite possible as well. As a result of it only being a vision, many want to say that it is not something to be used for a defense in believing there is immediate life after death, or that there can be a holding place for the dead. However, the interesting thing here is that the disciples were not shocked at what they saw. Remember, they thought this was real. They accepted it as reality. In fact, they stepped up to make tents, most likely because it was close to Sukkot. And we must remember that even if it was indeed just a vision, would Yeshua let them see a vision that was not biblical? Meaning, if Moses and Elijah were truly dead until the resurrection, why would Yeshua make them believe they could be in some kind of conscious existence and even be brought to earth as when King Saul had Samuel brought up? If this event wasn't at least something that was possible, why wouldn't Yeshua have corrected their mentality after seeing these two with him? If it wasn't something as being possible, wouldn't Yeshua have said, What you just saw isn't even possible. Moses and Elijah are dead and won't be alive until the resurrection. Yet we see that he said nothing of the like. If it was something that was simply not true, or if it was a pagan belief that something like this could actually happen, why would Yeshua make them see this all in a vision? And why would the disciples not have questioned it to Yeshua if it opposed what the Hebrew faith accepted? It doesn't add up. However, they weren't dead. So, he didn't correct their understanding of the vision. He simply told them it was only a vision. But, if they were alive, where could they have been living? Could it not have been in Sheol? It would seem that Sheol could have been divided in two that being the place of the righteous and the place that has been referred to as hell. All the dead went to one of these sides of Sheol. Some would say, but wait a minute, Ecclesiastes 12 says that our spirit returns to Yahweh. And we agree, as it says, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, And the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit, Ruach, returns to God who gave it. So, our spirit indeed returns to God. But where did he place them? Did he put them in Sheol? If someone borrows some tools from me and then returns them to me by putting them in my garage, were they returned to me? Absolutely. They didn't have to be returned to my hands. They were placed where I kept them. Likewise, the spirits indeed returned to Yahweh, placed where he kept them. 
Consider even the words of Yeshua on the cross. Luke 23, 46. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. So, where did his spirit go? We'll cover that in the second half of this first part. And I'll stop there. So, uh, you know, I know Lex covered a fair amount of this stuff in the uh, two shows that we did together, and I'm sure he covered more in his book. Steve brought up, I think, some good yeah, but points. Uh, but then again, I think Lex has some really good points regarding the first resurrection. And so uh, it's something I'm going to have to think about and pray about, and uh, maybe you will too. All right. That's all, all the time we have for this broadcast. See you next time. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.